Hi, everybody online uh, on the edge. This is me. Uh, and uh, physically in person. This is going to be a really special lecture today. We waited a while to get this exciting group of speakers together, and it's so good that it's all happening. So, first, I'm totally pleased to introduce John Radoff. Uh, I've met John on local VR, AR panels, evaluating future ideas here around Boston. He's one of the real go to guys within, you know, probably a, a couple hundred miles of here, at least, if not longer, for VR, AR stuff. Uh, he's got a reputation that just is, uh, is massive in this space. He's a very early player. Actually, both of the speakers today, Jean Marnier and John, are <laughs> early players in the whole idea of uh, virtual reality. Uh, John uh, started in, in actually the game industry, uh, but he began uh, his career, I guess, in that institution down the street that we kind of know him of, uh, a brethren institution, Harvard. And uh, with some of you come from Harvard, actually, a good number of you do. Uh, I was just there to lecture the VR hackathon uh, last week. Best science that we had. Just, just one of those. Uh, but John, like so many famous Harvard alums, didn't really stay. He uh, he heard the siren call to start a company, I guess, right? So he stopped his Harvard education, like other famous entrepreneurs did, and did very well as a result. Uh, he started uh, Novalink, an early internet service provider. But then while he was there, he created Legends of Future Past, one of the first commercial, can you pronounce that name? I should know it because it's a standard. Do I give the letters or is that a word? Oh, MMORPG, okay. Massively Multiplayer Online Role Playing. That's what I thought about. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, John has thought deeply about, again, the roles of virtual worlds in games and also social roles people play in these environments and how that plays out to other things besides games. But since that, John founded and advised many game companies. He's currently the CEO and co-founder of Gameable, a live game services platform that enables the creation of online games based on Unity. So, John, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me here at the Media Lab. So, Joe kind of told what I've done, but the 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 con common thread through my career has all been about creativity and people getting to do cool stuff online. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about the metaverse, what that means, whether it's even still a good term, but through the lens of humanity and culture, and also how that's rapidly accelerating with some of the tools we have available now, which includes stuff like platforms for user-generated content, sandbox worlds, and the very, very quickly accelerating universe of, of generative AI technologies. All of these things are gonna come together to my talk. Well, let's start with the idea of what the metaverse is anyway, because uh, we've, we're talking today about where that we've been here before. And, you know, the whole word meta goes way back to ancient Greece. It didn't really get used in the current meaning, which is sort of information about information until around 1920, when it became the field of meta mathematics. Then we had meta programming. Metaprogramming came out of Lisp programming with that meta key on the on the Lisp keyboard. The book in 1967 was one of Timothy Leary's favorites because it was all about, uh, frankly, taking acid and and uh, figuring out how you could reprogram your brain. So it was very much metaprogramming of of the human. And then we've got you know meta everything. Suddenly meta can appear in everything, and then metaverse appears. Now, I think metaverse, when Neil Stevenson was talking about it, he was thinking of it almost like a digital plane of existence that you could kind of live an alternate life in. But I really like the idea of applying the other meaning of meta, this idea of meta programming and information about information back to it as well, because I think as you'll hear in my presentation today, the idea of shaping worlds and exposing ourselves to them and allowing us to shape experiences that then affect us as well, such as creating an avatar online, wearing it in real life, we're starting to blur the distinction of like who we are with our digital personas online. Now, in the current era of metaverse, there have been a lot of people who have tried to co-opt this term, and that's why with Fortnite creator mode and Roblox and a company that we all know who actually renamed themselves to Meta to go after this term, as well as some of these Web3 blockchain things like Decentraland. Everybody has been going after this term. And the problem is that all those things are not the same. And that has led to a lot of market confusion. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on 
you know, what people mean by those terms first, usually they mean one of three things. They're either talking about an AR, VR embodied experience. That's, that's kind of the Facebook meta version of the world. Sometimes they mean a virtual world platform. And that could be like Roblox, Fortnite, Second Light, all of these things. Or sometimes they, they have something about blockchain in mind where it's currencies and virtual asset ownership and stuff. And all of those are totally fine. Those are, those are perfectly capable product definitions, product manifestations of what the metaverse can be. But I don't really think they tell us anything really important about what the metaverse is. You could look at it through the lens instead, not of like these product definitions, but what do you do with the metaverse? So a big part of what I find people do is it's a stage for storytelling, for imagination. You kind of explore other planes of existence. That I think goes back to what Neil Stevenson was getting at when he thought about a digital plane of ex existence that you could live on. It's about real-time activities. So most of the internet and the web thus far has been more transactional in nature. You go to a page, you look at information, you pull information off of it. This is activities. And by its very nature, you're then in social experiences with people. And sometimes it's actually about transforming the reality we live in in the sense of you take this digital plane of existence and you layer it back on the physical space. That's augmented reality. Okay, but I still find that the things you do with the metaverse still doesn't capture the heart of what actually what's important to, about this. I want to think about, you know, why do we even have a metaverse? Why is this a thing at this time? So let's let's roll back way in time here and think about what a proto metaverse would have been. And I would argue that all games are essentially the proto metaverse. Games are abstractions of reality, right? They have elements of storytelling, there's some kind of shared imaginary space that has to take place to play a game. So we look here at that ancient 20-sided die. It's not a Dungeons and Dragons die for those of you who are familiar with D20s. That's over a thousand year old object that was used in games in, in the past. Chess has been around for a long time. If you played chess as a purely mathematical abstraction, you could do that. You could actually create some kind of mathematical set of rules that says, here's how you play chess, but it's a lot more engaging to think of it as a military conflict with kings and queens. And the fact that we have characters allows you to kind of visualize and think about what chess represents. And the fact that you can sit there with another player and enter this imaginary experience is what makes chess interesting. This is true of pretty much all games. I'm sure because it's games, there will be some exception that someone will tell me about later, but in general, that's what games are. All games had this sort of constrained experience until really Gary Gygax had this amazing vision around letting people tell stories together, but also combining it with a set of rules. Dungeons and Dragons is so interesting that I often think of it as the first move away from those proto metaverses to maybe a real metaverse. And its instantiation originally had nothing to do with computers and online networks and whatnot, but it is a shared imaginative space. It's a place for creativity. You get to take on different roles and there's enormous emergent play and emergence is something I'm gonna spend a lot of time on in this talk as well, because it has, a, it has a big role to play in all these sandbox worlds and where we go next with AI, but it's emergent because you can't really fully predict the outcome. Even the dungeon master, who may have an idea about where he wants to take the story of the game has to accommodate the various inputs from the other players. And that means that it all gets interwoven together into a story which is entirely emergent in its properties. So a few decades ago, we started taking all of these game experiences and we started turning them into digital experiences. That's what I think the metaverse now means. It's about taking these imaginary spaces and just digitizing them, dematerializing them, allowing us to cross time and spatial barriers and give us a place where we can go through similar imaginative experiences together online without having to necessarily meet in person. So the thing I'm getting at here though is because of the digitization that's happening around this and because of these kind of proto worlds where we have this inherent desire as humans to create, to share, to socialize, to connect through storytelling, 
we're entering a new phase. Think about how much life has changed in the last 20 years. We had online stuff more than 20 years ago, the bulletin boards and stuff, but it wasn't as widespread as it is now. Compare 20 years ago to what we have today in terms of how important the digital realm is for all aspects of your life. For most people, you are participating in online games, you're in social media, maybe you're in esports, maybe you've done online dating, maybe you participated as a viewer or even a streamer yourself in live streaming platforms. Maybe you've done some of the cryptocurrency stuff. Maybe like me, you're capturing the biometrics 24 hours a day and uploading it to the internet where AI figures out how to tell me how to live a better life. So all of this digital realm is part of what we do now. And I think that it's digital identity at its core. And I'm gonna elaborate on digital identity and, and where that really goes next. But the key idea here is our identities, who we are, is now very much comprised not only of who we are physically, but who we are digitally. And that's changing a lot of the trajectory of human civilization. Now, a way that we express our identity online is through avatars. And this is the idea that I want to represent myself online and appear how I want to appear. That appearance could be completely different than I want to be in, in real life. You could be, you could look like and be any person you want to be. That said, that identity through an avatar, I think is the very first baby steps on a path. It's the core of the path, but where we go next is all about extending ourselves further into the digital realm. So if avatars and Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts and all of these things are the basics of identity, the, the way we initially present ourselves online. The next step beyond that is our expression. What do we make online? What do we put out online as digital beings? And there's a stage even beyond that, which is taking our will and directing it to go and do things online that, we, that are important to us. And that's a big part of where artificial intelligence technology is gonna take us. Okay, so I've been talking about ourselves and our, our, our kind of digital identity online and how we project ourselves as humans into space. That's not the only thing we're projecting into space. We're actually projecting physical space into meta space as well. So we're taking our objects with us. I'm gonna start going into you know, some more specific examples now of how some of these things are happening, getting into technologies and stuff. But just as we're projecting our personas into digital space, we're starting to take things with us into space. This really interesting field of reality capture allows you to take objects from the real world with you. So in the past, it might have been model something with a 3D system, design something and put it into, into digital space. That no doubt will continue in some respects, although generative AI is going to displace a significant chunk of it. We'll get to that as well. But this is a little demo I actually put together a couple months back when there's still snow on the ground here in Massachusetts. So this looks like a film. It's not a film. This is, this is all digitally generated. The gargoyle's real. I scanned it. You can see the 3D model that it pulled in there. And this is by taking a sparse number of photos on my phone using a technology called neural radiance fields, or NERF for short. What's cool about NERF is that it's the opposite of ray tracing. So ray tracing, what is happening is you're essentially simulating the physics of light and how light reflects off objects and then how that light makes it into the camera. And that's how we play a lot of 3D graphics games today. Um, although there's a whole set of hacks and shader graph programming stuff we're not gonna get into today, but for at least for cinematic stuff, not so much games quite yet, it's still ray tracing. And Nerf is the opposite of that. So if you take a bunch of photos, it, see how, it sees how the light landed and you essentially back into what the light bounced off of that gives you geometry. That's one way we can take objects with us into digital space, which is going to lead to even more creativity I'm gonna to get to next. You could think of the 3D graphic importation of reality into digital space as the very most basic 
aspect of a digital twin. Digital twins were originally really pioneered by NASA when they thought of ways that they could create a spaceship representation back on Earth for things that were in space and synthesize it into all of the data about that particular object, all its physical properties, what it's doing and whatnot. We're going to have more and more digital twins. So just like that gargoyle, we're going to have lots of objects in the real world that do that. You can scale that up. So you can scale that up to not just individual objects, but to entire factories. And if you can do it in a factory, you could do an entire city. So smart cities are really about having a digital twin at the scale of the entire city, knowing all the physical properties, but also the social properties that are going on there. Why stop at a start smart city? You can do a twin Earth. So NVIDIA recently talked about Earth 2, which is a supercomputer application, a supercomputer and an application that they've built to simulate the entire world and do things like climate modeling on it. We can take that data that we've captured and project it back into the real world. When I was in uh, Nepal a few months back, I could, there's a lot of mountains there. I couldn't identify all the mountains. Maybe you didn't realize that that's Mount Everest over there on the side, but I was looking at Mount Everest and you could look at all this information using AI to interpret the environment, using geolocation, putting it all together and telling you actually what's around you in the real world. So just as I'm wearing the avatar of myself right now, digital realm is also going to affect the real world, right? It's everything from when you go and go to a Starbucks now and there's a mobile ordering line. It's everything about putting information and augmented reality back into real space. The smart cities we were talking about, the refactoring of all of our highway systems to accommodate autonomous vehicles, the fact that we even have media rooms in our home. So there's a, there's a loop that's going on here. As more and more things come online, it'll affect the real world. As the real world is affected by that, it will be a positive feedback loop into digitizing more and more of it. Okay, so that was us projecting ourselves into digital space, us projecting the physical space into digital space. Now I wanna talk about emergence and creativity and the next stage that we're going to for identity. So the, the idea of emergence is just a simple one at its core, which is when you have systems with a certain initial set, it's really, really hard to predict exactly where it's going to go. And it can have lots and lots of different forms. We see this in flocks of birds. We see it in Penrose snowflakes. Is the example is here. The classic example is game of life. Game of life is interesting because there's a creative aspect to it you choose which cells you want to activate at the beginning, and then you get to see what the emergent properties of those cells are. A somewhat lesser known property of Game of Life is that this is actually a Turing complete computing platform. So you can actually create and and OR gates on Game of Life and build computers that can process, in theory, any computer program. So really interesting to think that with this very, very simple system with really only like three basic rules of behavior, you could actually build computers in it. So I spend a lot of time thinking about what creativity is. Uh, there's this old book from about 1937 by Olaf Stapledon called Star Maker. And I'm not going to get into the book itself right now, but he had the notion that some super advanced civilizations that could exist could actually simulate all the possibility spaces that would actually exist. It's an interesting way to think of creativity in that the universe is structured around an infinite number. Well, I don't know if it's infinite or not, but a heck of a lot of parameters and variables that you can adjust. Creativity then could be thought of as kind of finding solutions within this vast parameter space. Humans tend to be pretty good at it. Um, the founder of Harmonix, who teaches here at MIT, uh, was asked, you know, how many pieces of music are there? Uh, and the answer is a lot. <laughs> and if you look at one example, which is back suite number one, if you give it 40 bars of 16th notes and three octaves, then you get 36 to the power of 640 possible melodies. I think that's a pretty, really very large number. And we haven't even accounted for all the different instruments, textures, songs, voices, sounds, combinations, compositions all the things that you could possibly turn into music. I don't, I don't know how many more exponential things would be on that, but it's a pretty vast search space. 
for creativity. There was an interesting paper recently in the field of artificial intelligence as it's applied to astrophysics actually, where he figured out that you could make some of these symbolic regression algorithms a lot more efficient by identifying which of the paths you can't go down, right? So if you thought of that as like music, well, there's probably a lot of music that just is not gonna sound good based on um, some basic properties that we know about music. And you could maybe exclude that from the search. And they were able to do things in this paper like um, rediscover relativity all over again by feeding it a bunch of data, eliminating a lot of the paths that it could go on and getting down to that constrained search, spa search space. So I think of creativity sometimes as an efficient process for finding the, finding the solutions that are really interesting for people. Let's talk about how this has played out inside games. So World of Warcraft is a really great petri dish for a lot of emergent behavior. Years ago, there was this thing called the corrupted blood in incident where they accidentally unleashed uh, actually a simulated virus in the world because you'd catch a disease from this creature in it, and then you could spread it to other people. They didn't realize that people would teleport back to town really fast, spread the disease, and basically cause widespread doom. What, what you're seeing there on the screen is all the skeletons of people in the, in the town that died because they got it. So you had really interesting emergent properties there. Like some people wanted to be super helpful. They were like the, uh, the doctors telling people, you know, avoid this zone, the, the pandemic is spreading there. But of course you had the players who thought it was really hilarious to see a whole city get destroyed. That's just an example of emergence. But the important takeaway in this is not just the complexity of something like World of Warcraft, but all of those variables that you also introduce when you create a social system that's present and you suddenly are throwing humans and all the varied human behaviors that people can have. A lot of where we're going now is allowing humans to enter creative spaces and not just play a progression kind of game with some social features like World of Warcraft, but express their own creativity, which really is about taking who we are as people, our identity, and extending it into the realm of our self-expression. What is it that we want to talk about? What you see there is one of the you know, most sophisticated cities that has been built in Minecraft, and that's mid-journey art, where the art itself, uh, I'd say, is fairly emergent. The creativity of it comes from what is the prompt that you want to put into it. Today, we have lots of these worlds that can do various forms of creative emergence. It runs from Second Life, which was a real pioneer in this, but now Fortnite creator mode, where people uh, I hear are already making millions of dollars because they're sharing their revenue to build additional worlds and levels and islands off of the Fortnite game. You've got Roblox, which actually is a programming system. And then you've got Minecraft, which can be programmed in. So speaking of Minecraft, I mentioned earlier that Game of Life is touring complete. Well, Minecraft is touring complete as well, even without getting into the Java programming of the game servers. So if you're familiar with Minecraft, you probably run into this, this um, thing called Redstone in it. So Redstone lets you build things like circuits. As soon as you can build circuits, you can build anything. So people have built computers in Minecraft. They've built computers that you can play Tetris on, for example. And this super interesting one from the last year is a guy took a few months and he built a convolutional neural network inside Minecraft. So he actually made it so you could do digit recognition inside Minecraft using simply the features that are built into Minecraft. No magical programming in Java underneath using APIs to sort through the information, just using Redstone and structuring things and building circuits allowed this person to create a neural network. So he draws on it, he kind of has an input pad and you can see where it's receiving the input that he's putting in and on the right, the neural network has to do a, a digit recognition task where, which is a very well-worn set of um, weights and biases that you can just download off the internet now. So he's able to construct that neural net and do actual digit recognition. So that's a lot of emergence there. So user-generated content is one of the most interesting and growing areas of games in general. This is, a, this is from a company called Overwolf that I don't know that they would describe it this way, but in my mind, it's turning every game or game world that can exist into its own app store, meaning 
all that creativity, that emergence that we're just seeing there, is it possible to package it up in, a, in such a way that people can almost buy and sell content that, that is built off of the core game system of something else? All right, now when you add to that generative AI, you're going to have an even further acceleration of the creativity that people are gonna be capable of having. One of the folks who announced this recently was Roblox. So Roblox is an incredibly popular platform. It's 200 million plus people per month are in Roblox. They're building things, they're building experiences. It's everything from professional game development studios now to hobbyists who wanna build things. And by combining it with generative AI, they're going to allow much more rapid creation of game objects. So just as I pulled objects from the real world, in my reality capture demo, you'll be able to do that, but also you'll be able to generate things into existence because by the way, the more and more reality capture we've done, all these generative AIs that are needed for 3D graphics are gonna feed off of that data set so that we can create more and more of these objects even without walking around with your phone and taking pictures. You can combine user generated content together. Oh, I guess I wasn't showing the the, uh, yeah, so this is an example of code generation inside Roblox happening here as in the way it actually changes the game through text prompts. You maybe call it fly instead of sit on the ground. So user-generated content within a more constrained rule set is affecting games alongside of generative AI. So one problem that emerges when you have people building all kinds of content kind of overwolf style off of a core game system is, well, maybe stuff doesn't match. It doesn't have consistency. This is a game that was recently announced just a few, that had announced a few days ago that they teamed up with a company called Scenario. Scenario does 2D image generation, aspires to do more than 2D in the future, but they do 2D image generation specifically for game assets. And a big part of it is establishing aesthetic uh, consistency in the, in the assets that are being created. So when you put that power in the hands of the individual people who are creating content in the game, now they can start adding to the core, the core game and you're almost crowdsourcing the extension of that game with stuff that actually fits together and isn't completely discontinuous. Sometimes discontinuous is good. You wanna have a completely different experience. Just like when you go to Roblox, there are things that look completely different from each other. There are other times where you wanna have a consistent world and that's where UGC and generative AI are fusing together. I mentioned earlier how we are able to import the real world into digital space. Well, alongside of generative AI, another really interesting area of creativity is actually reskinning reality. So this is an example by a digital creator named Balaval Sidhu. And what he did is he went to his parents' house. He took photos using photogrammetry recorded this living room. And then what he did is he used a combination of control net, which is a generative AI, along with another piece of software called EbSynth. He worked with all these things together. And what you're actually seeing here is as you go through the room, restyling the room. So the paintings are changing, the furniture styles are changing. So imagine what happens as this gets faster and faster and it's augmented reality glasses you'll get to the point where maybe you can just reskin reality around you in real time. Emergence is also a property of language models. So all this innovation, all this excitement around chat GPT right now is kind of fed by two things. One is it's a user in interface improvement. So they did a lot to make it easier to use and the results are better, but also the scale up in the number of the, the number of parameters it's got, the size of the GPUs, the supercomputing clusters, it started to express far more emergent properties. In particular, you're able to pose questions to it where it kind of has to make decisions. And that's super interesting. It's gone beyond language. So if you think of the most basic language model is an autocomplete that just looks at spell correction. And then we went to sentence completion. Now we're starting to probe something about the deep fabric of intelligence and reality itself through these tools. We're creating these incredibly large scaled out intelligent artifacts. And intelligence is a word, by the way, that I'm not 
exactly sure what it means either amongst, uh, amongst others. But I think of it again, maybe it's simpler to think of as intelligence is when you find the efficient paths through the search space of possibility. Now, because a lot of these language models have gotten so much more powerful, they're getting applied back to virtual worlds and games as well. So this is from a company called Hidden Door. They want to be able to take things like a book, a favorite movie series, take all of the stuff that makes that world unique, put it in a system, train up language models on it, and then be able to play in those worlds, but without kind of going off the rails into all the stuff that happens in a chat GPT. So instead of completely unconstrained, it's more like the Dungeons and Dragons experience. You're playing with a dungeon master who kind of keeps it a little bit in the box, but still gives you a lot of creativity to express yourself there. The experiment from Meta recently was, could you play diplomacy against a computer and could the computer win? So diplomacy is really complicated because you have to actually talk and negotiate with other players in the course of diplomacy. But what they, so what they needed to do was make the AI trustable, able to converse and able to defeat humans. And they found that they could actually train a computer that could defeat humans in the game of diplomacy. They think there's other applications of this, like use it to help negotiate things in the real world. Because if it can beat people in a game, maybe it can do that as well. Super interesting example of these AI characters is in a technology called um, video pre-training. So what they did here at OpenAI is they trained a character to go into Minecraft travel around and actually play the game on its own, trained on YouTube videos. So they fed it all kinds of YouTube videos of here's people playing Minecraft and they taught an AI how to actually go into Minecraft and be able to competently play the game, even do things like build little shelters for themselves. What about when you combine that back with humans? So there's a person who goes by Code Nico online. They're a live streamer on Twitch. They usually talk about games and all kinds of stuff in their life. She presents herself as a VTuber. That means she presents herself normally as a 3D avatar representation of herself. So that's her in the upper left. That's Code Nico, which is a human. Below her is a virtual being called Lucy, which is a character playing Minecraft with her. So we can start to think of these virtual beings as being even virtual friends, virtual societies which is precisely this field of generative agents, which uh, is now currently the very hot topic. If you go online and look up things like auto GPT, baby AGI, God mode, things like that. But Stanford a few weeks ago published a report called generative agents. What they did is they created a virtual world with buildings and stores and homes and things like that. They populated it with characters and the characters have to interact with each other using language. So they're all trained with language. They use GPT as the language system. And where they found that these had really interesting emergent properties as these characters would talk to each other. For example, you could ask one character a question and that might affect the entire society of people as they talked with each other about what was going on. So that's a lot of what's happening in terms of virtual beings and virtual characters. I want to kind of go think forward into the future now. So we talked about virtual identity, who we are online. We talked about these worlds in which we can create things, Minecraft, neural network, computers to places that we just go to for fun. When we start thinking about what AI could do for us, it, it leads us in an additional direction though, which is, can we actually carry out our will online? autonomously. And that's where these things like baby AGI uh, come in or auto GPT. This is an example of God mode. So God mode is a web browser based system where using language models, you can tell it what your goals are and then it'll formulate a plan and it'll go act on it. And you kind of approve steps as it goes through the process. And it'll do things like if you want to order it, Cup of coffee from Starbucks, it will find the Starbucks near you, enter the mobile order, and then I guess you'd have to go pick it up because we don't have humanoid androids that can do that part quite yet. But maybe uh, maybe someone will link it to Uber Eats and they'll go pick it up and bring it, bring it for you. So this is an idea that these virtual beings 
will be able to maybe do things in the real world, but they could also carry out your will in the online spaces as well. And I think that is the ultimate extension of the self. It's the idea that who we are becomes what we can create, but then we have these agents that can go out there to do the things that we want. I've called this the direct from imagination era of creativity, where we're gonna to get to the point where you just speak things into existence on computers. We can join up with our friends and go through these stories and experiences. We'll have digital agents that carry out our will in digital space, and we'll be exploring new planes of existence with them. The thing that I kind of want to wrap up with here, though, is the way this might sort out in the future, because there's centralized approaches to this and decentralized. Sometimes people use these terms with respect to blockchain technologies, but I'm thinking much bigger than blockchain. I'm thinking like the basics of the internet. The internet was built as a decentralized network. The domain name system is decentralized, which means that nobody really owns it. And I think there's risks associated with purely centralized AI systems where you have to go through APIs, pay someone on a model that was trained the way they want to build it. Um, it's good in this current state we're in, which is that the massive scale up in compute has been required. And I think the applications are wonderful. So I don't want to take anything away from these things either. But to truly carry out our own will for our own digital identities to carry out what we want to do online, I think it's going to require taking back some of these AI models onto our own devices. Very fast moving field, but you know, literally two days ago, Stability AI, the company that uh, did Stable Diffusion, which is mostly known for their image models today, released a language model and it's open source. There's the Dolly model that was released uh, also fairly recently from Databricks. These are models that you could run on your own. So these are light language models that because they're open source, you could fine tune it the way you want, but you could retrain it. You could do anything you want with it. And you have, you have the ability to even experiment on it. I mentioned how these are vast computational quote unquote intelligent objects. We don't have a lot of insight into that object when it's a centralized resource that we can't look at, but we'll be able to experiment on it as we gain access to it ourselves. I think that this is going to be the next most important internet battleground. It comes down to who owns artificial intelligence. Will it own to be enti owned entirely by organizations, or will we have access to AI models to direct them as we wish to do? So that's the sum total of my talk. Thank you for listening. I'm available online. You can plug the QR code in, or here's my links. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, John. We have certainly time for questions. Um, I'll start off with two, two straightforward ones. We'll first one straightforward anyway. Um, you're indeed a <laughs> great to see you again. Uh, another another coffee, chat over coffee here, except we're in the classroom. Um, John, I have great, great discussions. Um, you uh, you've been in gaming for a long time, really early in AR VR games. Uh, if you looked at your first slide there, we kind of what is metaverse? You saw somebody with a headset. You said that's one of the things you think about. Very little of what I saw you show requires that. What do you think the future is for the actual full up immersion? I mean, how how much of a stake is it now, and is that going to be a big part of it going forward? Or what do you think that really would play in? Um, well, I don't I don't think headsets are required for really amazing experiences that live on in your imagination and allow you to express creativity. Sometimes there are hindrances unless they weigh, I think the magical number is 60 grams or something. So if they weigh more than 60 grams, people don't wanna wear them all the time. So that's a little bit of a problem. The technology is going to improve down to the point where we can wear something roughly like sunglasses. So I think that when that happens, That'll change a lot. That's going to open up a lot of applications we don't have right now because it's going to become the ability to wear it continuously and interpret the world around us visually through that lens. Whereas right now you'd have to hold up your phone for a lot of augmented reality applications. So it's really constrained in terms of what you can actually do with it. Like the mountain climbing app that I showed in the course of that, that's augmented reality, but you have to think to use it and put your phone up. 
um, and use it because you're like, what is that mountain? But if the other version of it would be like, inform me about something really interesting in the environment I'm walking through, show me that super rare mushroom that's on the ground that I wouldn't have even taken note of at all unless the lens was picking it up. So that's an application of it. But I don't think AR VR hardware is required to, to go and have experiences online. And I think it's a little bit of a mistake to think of the metaverse as purely like an embodied AR VR experience. I think just having this shared storytelling space and being able to bring up the imagination in the mind is what's actually really important. I love the way you redefine meta or properly defined at the beginning. To cover <laughs> really great enough that. I'm cool. hoping mine will take on. Yeah, yeah. We, we support you in that time. Um, next one is going to AI. And, and you know, we can certainly spend a lot of time in the middle of talking about it. I'm sure there'll be a lot of ways to talk about where it's going to bring us here. But Sam Altman was at MIT, uh, it was like, I think, last week. And there's big headlines now from one of the things he said, which is that. Is hitting a roadblock, large language models. Yeah, you know, actually, I think you remember when ChatGPT, everyone was asking all these questions when first came out. The thing I wanted to do is give this singularity probe. What's going to make you more intelligent? And it said, Oh, I'm not intelligent. I'm just a chat. Uh, so it's okay. What's going to make you perform better? Uh, <laughs> more data. And I kept trying to say, You know, what else? No, more data. And if you talk to experts in AI that work in the field, this is oftentimes what they're saying more data. Now they're saying, No, uh, more data is not, it's asymptotic. It's not necessarily helping. What do you think is going to break the logjam? Uh, when we eventually do, assuming that's a lot here. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about what's going on in open AI, to my earlier point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have cognitive dissonance on, on open AI. I love everything that they're doing. I wish I could see more into what they're doing. The, um, the, my understanding is that a lot of the improvements going from GPT 3.5 to 4 were gained not simply through pure scale up of compute, but through a lot of tiny innovations, a lot of hyperparameter tuning. For all we know, it's a smaller model than GPT 3.5. And, and I think that's interesting to think about because to make it run on, you know, a phone, you know, we've got a decent amount of compute on this device now, um, an impressive amount of neural compute that pretty much nobody is using at the moment. Um, you'll still need a much smaller model to do inference on that device. That I think is gonna be a super interesting world. So there's there's kind of the two parts of it. You gotta train a model and you gotta, and then you wanna infer from the model. There's probably quite a few applications where we could get inference right down to the device. So we already do that with these diffusion models. For example, you can download stable diffusion onto a decent computer with, a, with, with not even the very best GPU, a reasonable GPU, and you can do inference and generate images on your machine training it is a lot more like training a stable diffusion model costs at least into the six figures to, to provision the gq uh, compute power currently and it depends on computers that have shared memory and very high speed interconnect which means they're basically supercomputers that are co-located i think a field that i'm very interested in which doesn't seem like it's gotten enough progress yet as well. Is there a way to distribute the training computation so that you can do effective training with a lower latency across the internet, for example? I, I haven't seen anything yet that shows that it can be done, but I don't know of any law of physics that says that it can't. So I think that someone will probably figure it out and that can be interesting. But if we could start to train in big networks, that would be super cool in terms of pushing out the ability to train up models because it's a lot easier, economically speaking, to ask a bunch of iPhone users, for example, to pay the electric bill for the GPU supercomputer every time they plug in their phone to recharge, which is basically the way that would work, as opposed to the very high cost of, of operating supercomputers, not to mention the capital expenditure that's involved. But from an inference level, you're gonna get this capability on devices really soon. I mentioned in the talk, uh, a company called uh, Hidden Door. Hillary Mason's the CEO of that company. Her whole thing, is, and I've spoken to her, you can find a conversation I had online with her recently. Her whole thing is actually getting the models much smaller. Like mo smaller models can be far more efficient. So rather than train them 
train very expensive models up in the cloud. Why not get them to a level of simplicity? And, and that opens up the option to either run it in the cloud, if that's the way you want to operate your business model, or push it onto device. So long answer to your question is, eventually, a lot of the everyday uses of AI, maybe not modeling the the planet scale climate, but for a lot of the things that we're going to do, like interact with virtual beings and characters and be part of simulated worlds, it's going to come get pushed a lot more down to device, probably for purely economic reasons. I think that's a frontier that's much more attractive. I mean, who knows really where the next robots are making machines more intelligent, so to speak, right? It's a long discussion for some forever. But uh, it, it is obviously a, a, a vector for embedding it into you know, smaller platforms. I think you're at the phone is a natural place is already there on there. But we talk about sensory networks where you actually you know, put it close to something that runs on a tiny battery. Mm -hmm. Think of how the ant brains combine with the mouse brains to combine with the cat brains, essentially. <laughs> and that leads to your other point because one issue there is you've got roadblocks at every point. So if you have a vastly connected server that can send high bandwidth measures all over the place. You know, the, the brain basically does that at a much slower speed with higher density. It helps to have everything nearby. Mm -hmm. If you, you have a, a thin pipe, even over the internet, it's still a pipe and it's still confined to pretty much probably doesn't mess with a parallel machine. Uh, you're going to start to have these roadblocks that are going to you know, affect how much you're going to get layers to layers or segment to segment. Uh, Ramesh here is uh, doing cybersecurity with that. But, uh, uh, where you can make it secure at every point. So mm -hmm. when you train it up, you actually have some privacy over the data that goes in. Federated learning. Yes. Yep. That, that uh, but uh, yeah, a training framework where you actually optimize it all for those narrow lanes. It's kind of intriguing. So mm -hmm. you break the brain up and optimize the whole thing so that it works. Maybe the way the radio works, you know, the mm -hmm. reversal of the way we do it now. Uh, other questions? Uh, well, thank you for that. You're very inspired. Um, and I want to start off by saying that as long as we are social, we are inherently social beings. Um, and you were touching on the whole way of sending ourselves into the digital realm. And I was wondering how social connectedness is emerging in these virtual worlds. You could touch on that. Our social connection is emerging. So if you look at Games like World of Warcraft, they're inherently social. And in fact, when I've spoken to some of the designers who were early at World of Warcraft, some of them would tell you they were really building a chat room with a lot of cool things you could do around the chat. So it is the chat, the social connection that people are forming with each other. That's the whole core of that. And just like you can suddenly get a convolutional neural network by building blocks of redstone in Minecraft, and you can get the corrupted blood thing in, in, um, work, in World of Warcraft, it's essentially what are the applications of chat, right? So the applications of chat are essentially, you know, near infinite. So there, there's, there's tons of emergent things and emergence by its nature uh, is that I can't predict all the, all the versions of that emergence. Um, if you look at Roblox, that's another interesting case, though, because sometimes if there are so there are people out there that don't fully understand Roblox. Let me just explain that for a moment. So Roblox isn't a game. World of Warcraft is a game. World Roblox isn't a game. It's essentially a fusion of a kind of social media with individual worlds that people can create. The closest analogy would be like YouTube for game creators. So it's got a platform in which you can discover a world that you want to play in. You can create worlds and it, and it forms the network that allows people to find each other. But what's really interesting there is now that you've got a social group, there's a lot of social glue within the overall environment of Roblox. So you might love a particular game or world inside Roblox, but the fact that you have a bunch of friends that can now come with you it creates this really interesting dynamic, which we don't really have in, in many other aspects of the internet, which is you might be doing something for in one moment with your circle of friends, your three, four, five, ten people that you're hanging out with. You're like, we're done with this. Let's jump into this other experience and do that instead. So we don't do that with websites. We're not like, hey, let's everybody look at this web page and then go to this other web page next. The fact that you've got this activity that you're actually experiencing together is what enables that. So 
there's lots of really interesting emergent social structures that are happening from that. To draw upon the blockchain world, this idea of decentralized autonomous organizations, a DAO, is, an, is a manifestation of that, which is, is there a way to create new governance systems, in their case, around the financialization of, of governing structures? And, and we could debate the pros and cons of, of whether that makes sense at all or in particular cases. But nevertheless, it's a social system, a social structure, which I think is interesting to look at. So as people do more and more of these things, it's interesting to think about what happens with the agents that represent us online, and then how do we form governance around that? And how will, how will our intelligent agents working for us play with each other, right? So that thing that I showed you of Lucy earlier, Lucy is one virtual being, but the founder of that company is a guy named Edward Saatchi, um, Fable Simulation. His idea is to get 10 million virtual beings participating with each other, living their own life. They're doing things when you're not watching them. You can interact with any of them and kind of learn what they've been up to. You can play games with them. They can kind of befriend you. So you, you can... You could start to think about all the really interesting social structures that are going to emerge from that. But again, it's going to be emergent. We don't know yet. We're go we're going to discover it soon. Sorry, so sorry, I have a question. So I'm a, I'm busy. I'm an early tech fellow at Cornell Tech. I'm doing a project in the metaverse uh, at the moment, but I'm just looking at the interface with cities. So I'm coming up with Pokemon Go phenomenon of augmented reality. I'm curious with you on this about where. AR might intersect with physical infrastructures and externalities and how um, security data covering it is meant to look at. Because like obviously right now you can use everything AI builds, you're looking at missions, far from one right with the metaverse. Um, how do we sure we like mitigate the externalities? Because I think there's that famous paper that like 30,000 people might have through the first five months of Pokemon Go and distracted driving, not even players at all. Um, so I don't know, I'm curious to tell us about what like what are the other potential I don't know, yeah, uses for unintended consequences. You hailed some of that of, of AR out of the world. Snap is making an ever bigger push to AR. They talked about it yesterday, et cetera. But how do you think about how those use cases and wouldn't that get emerged? Like, is that going to be again a pure hardware set of the headsets? Like, is it a game mechanic that we'll use on our smartphones? Or I'm mean, curious your thoughts there about where AR are and how those uh, emerging as well. Lots of questions. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm a little bit terrified of regulation in the sense that I, I'm, I'm concerned that people don't have the ability to think out all the implications and things like regulatory capture. I, I think there are, of course, real safety issues that are of concern, but I also don't want to throw out the potential for all the society improving, civilizational improving effects that will that will be a huge net benefit to us. So. I, I worry about any rush to to regulation in any form. Um, so when you think about the capabilities of augmented reality, I, I just want to go back to sort of Joe and I's earlier brief conversation around that and, and maybe double click on it. So when I was giving a mushroom example of like detecting the object in the world, right now AR is a pull mechanism but it can become a push mechanism. What I mean by that is when you play Pokemon Go, I mean, you have to pull out your phone and tell it, you have to check in basically. So it's, it's essentially a check-in mechanic. So you use it when you think of it, which is fine for a lot of applications. Pull is great, like pull is basically most applications that we use today. Push applications are really interesting as well because it allows you to consume a massive amount of contextual information, data about your environment, things fed to you by IoT, things fed to you through the cameras around your devices. You can have an AI layer sitting there that can make inferences about the environment that you're in, filter that up to uh, notification mechanisms that are that you choose, right? Like I don't want, I don't think anybody wants to be continuously augmented reality spammed about everything that you're dealing with. But if I can curate my choices of that, that's going to be really interesting because that that opens up a whole new class of applications. Just the fact that the device is something you can integrate into your life and use it continuously makes available applications that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get at. But when I talk about projecting our will onto, onto the online world through intelligent agents, like an auto G, like the next generation of God mode and auto GPT, I'm also thinking about 
our own agency about interpreting the online world. So right now in the centralized version of the world, it's really governed by algorithms whose objective function is revenue and EBITDA for an organization. It's totally fine. I'm a capitalist. Like I, I get it. Um, but I personally want to live in a world where it's op where my online experience is optimized around the objective function that I set. So I'm going to set an objective function, which is maximize my well-being through life or something like that. And that, that's all that I care about. And if my intelligent agent wants to let me know that it discovered a product or service that I ought to consider paying for, because it's looked at all the information available and it's pattern matched that based on my criteria to what I want, that's an example of projecting our will out into the world. And that's going to come back into the world of AR and how we interpret smart cities and this huge, huge fire hose of data that will be upon us. It, it's got to be something we curate through our own intelligent layer that we've built to that. In, 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 well, in the, in the back there first, because he, 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 he preempted you, sorry. I remember the Colossal Blood incident I was there, um, maybe it was about 2005 or six. I was about 14 years old at the time, and uh, I was quite leveling up my character. And uh, when I joined the city, people were dying, and then I started dying. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't quite understand what was happening at the time because I was a new player. Uh, but then I quit the game. I left the game for a bit. And uh, then I this game's too hard. <laughs> you just die when you go to the city. People go out to troll and people go out to escape. And uh, it was interesting to have a, a little sample of what life could look like uh, as a kid. Uh, but then um, after playing one for about 20 years, it left a really sour taste in my mouth. Um, it was the decades of the show, escape the season. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about life coming from the third world country. I learned about, you know, uh, at a global scale, how to interact with people. I learned about uh, people's psychology. But the game essentially creates this divide and it implements this doctrine between, you know, having two passions, two colors, a lion, sports. And when that's not enough, then it's PPE, players versus the environment. It's PPE, players against each other. And, you know, it's it's a really quite dangerous uh, philosophy, in my opinion, to essentiate that in uh, kids growing up. And I always look at Minecraft and other games like that that actually brought something educational, something that actually made you build. And, you know, I love building things. I, I built Legos and, and, and uh, played with PC logo and Turtle and all that. It was really educational. And I like, always dreamt about, like, if there is a merge, between something as cool and engaging and, and addictive as World of Warcraft, but as educational and scientific, maybe as Minecraft. That, uh, and that's something that I feel like is missing in the industry today. Would it be cool to, to create your CAD models and share them on in that game or create PCBs or snippets of code where other people could engage with uh, the art of creation and learn from that? But that's something that I'm maybe a robot uh, is attempting to, to do that, but. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure it's fitting these both worlds uh, in harmony. Uh, my final, my real question to you now is uh, about, you know, the, the rise of AI system in agents and chat GPT, and it's wonderful. I've been using it almost every day for various things, and um, astonished by it. And every time I get uh, within depth through the conversation, um, you feel like there's some sentient uh, being that comes to existence, but then it shuts down and it, it uh, gives me errors and it breaks, and then it gets dumb again and we're starting <laughs> over again. So I have a feeling that they have these algorithms tuned to like actually uh, bring it back down. And I just want to ask you where do you think we're going with all of that? In society, like the companies are banning it, uh, countries are banning it, people are misusing AI to, like, you know, call the police and, and, and do uh, malicious actors are using AI. Where do you think we're going with that in society? Well, that, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said malicious actors, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of focus on this idea of X risk, existential risk. It's probably not a 0% chance, but the real risk is what humans do with these things. So I think it's totally valid to be concerned about that. So 
there's going to be everything from industrial accidents to criminals that that misuse it and, and do bad things with it. So we'll have to have first defensive technologies, right? So, you know, just knowing the authenticity of content and who it came from is going to be very important. We already have a deep fake problem. So, you know, it's possible that we'll, so we'll solve that through cryptographic signing and even blockchain technologies because they are good at showing the provenance of, of information and content. That's an example of something that we're going to need to sort out because you're going to need you're going to need to know yesterday um, if the person you're communicating with is actually that person. So that's an example of technologically speaking how we're going to get to it. I think there's huge huge risks for any country that you know just sort of bans it. I think they'll be very disabled in the economy we're going into. The reality is these technologies will be available and the way that I think you can actually mitigate some of these risks is open it up, open source these things, be transparent, let people experiment on the weights. Look at, look at software, generally speaking. So the best software in the world that we have from a security standpoint is open source software because it's continuously exposed to a crowdsourced community that goes and determines what the flaws are. So things that are closed up, we're relying on them to do all the fixes. And then if that's all we have, then ultimately you depend on governments to come up with rules that they have to live by. Then you've got regulatory capture. Then you've got only the largest of companies can participate in it at all. And who knows what the heck they're going to do because they're going to optimize on an objective function that is not what you, know, you or I would do. So I, I think it does come down to exposing these things to light, expose them to the potential for experimentation and allow individuals to work with them. Of course, some individuals are gonna misuse it. There's, there's no question. Individuals misuse email, they misuse cryptocurrency, they go in games and have toxic behavior like you were describing. So, you know, humans can suck a lot of the time, unfortunately, and that's nothing we're gonna do is gonna change that about people. AI could empower some of those people to do even more malicious things. The net benefit is going to be put the power in, in the hands of individuals. I think that on balance, the, the good of society will prevail over that. So it is, um, we're running a little bit out of time. I think a lot of the questions that are in the chat, um, more or less were answered throughout this conversation. But I think one one point that adds to the conversation that we two just had is there's one question about what, what do you think about that uh, how the AI letter that was going through media that we should um, you know, stay put and not should, continue. Oh, should we pause six months? I mean, yeah. that would require a, a long talk. It, yeah, the answer is no. I think that makes no sense. I don't even know how you quantify that. What what is what is more powerful than GPT four even? Yeah. So. I, I don't I think the better would be like let's let's open source some of these things and we're seeing that happening with Dolly model, et cetera. I, I don't I don't think there's any putting that genie back in the bottle. Like we've got GPUs. GPUs are going to enable this. And if people can't do it in one place, they'll go to the place where they can do it. And then you're just shifting the innovation off the board. So like I I uh, I think we have to invest in the engineering. I don't think we should be in the business of telling individual companies or um, researchers what they can or can't work on. But I think we do have to hold the people accountable to you know, harm that they cause, just like any product. Like we have product liability. If someone is damaged by something, we hold people accountable to that. So that's something that makes sense to me. But I just, I think I, I have been in a lot of these conversations. My personal feeling is regulation is going to come. And I'm just, because I just think talking to lots of the quote unquote man on the street around this, there is a lot of fear that question gets asked, existential risk questions get asked. And, um, and, and, I, and I think the fear is real and palpable and it will drive politicians towards um, reacting to that potentially in a way that isn't productive from innovation and, and may even be a net worsening of safety you know, so that worries me a lot the rush the rush to regulation the rush to say hey push a button and pause it worries me a lot um so the answer is no don't do, press do, the pause button do you think that fear comes from 
the closeness of the organizations that push this forward right now? Yes. Not just, not just. Yeah, no, I think people see the power of these technologies. And we as humans evolved to find agency in everything around us. So, you know, we comes from animals, right? People find agency in a rock. They find agency in a cloud. So we're wired for that. Why? Because it's a survival advantage. It's better to guess that something has agency than not, because it might be trying to kill you. That's exactly what's happening right now. We're, we're evolved for this, right? I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll make one quick comment, then we'll have this type of question, but in some sense, maybe our intelligent agent talked quite a bit about that, I believe it too. It could be a protective layer for individuals around mm -hmm. this, but how can we trust our intelligent agent? And that could be a great segue to Jaron who thinks about that too. So maybe it's interesting synergy there. Great. So thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.